I will say that, and as I, as I said in my statement, that the U.S. federal government is on an unsustainable fiscal path, by which is meant that the that debt as a percentage of GDP is growing and now growing sharply, going growing quickly, uh, faster, and and that's debt is unsustainable by definition. We need to stabilize debt to GDP. Um, the timing of doing that, the ways of doing it, through revenue, through spending, all all of those things are are not for the Fed to to decide. But what? But as perhaps, for lack of a better term, one of the chief economists in the nation, to be able to get advi give advice to the to the folks that are out there, to the country as a whole, about the things that we have in our future, and about the threats to our future, Social Security will go bankrupt unless we start managing it. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, on the I think, current trajectory, I, I think I, if I could say it this way, I think what happens over time is that um, we wind up spending more and more of our precious revenues uh, to service the debt, to pay interest to people who own the debt, as opposed to investing in the things that we really need: education, all, all the things that we need to be investing in so, in so that we can compete in the global economy. Sunday, October 1st. We got a fresh start here, folks. If you had a bad month last month, whether be it in trading, investing, or personally, rest assured with the right mindset, you got a fresh start right now, you'll bounce back. And of course, this is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. Now, folks, I got a good one for you tonight. But of course, we're all watching uh, Chairman Powell of the Fed in his attempt, Captain Powell, of soft landing uh, the plane that we call the economy. And I think that the British Airways pilot who's doing cocaine out of topless women before flights has a better chance in doing a soft landing than Jerome Powell. But, folks, we've got a serious topic here, so let's talk about it. You see, every great empire in history was born out of great wars. They defeated other competitors, took over the resources, influenced the rest of the world. They became dominant in language, in culture, in currency. And this is the honeymoon phase of any empire, enjoying the greatness. And one would argue that the United States of America is perhaps the greatest empire in the history of humanity. We won the Great War, and since then we've dominated culturally economically and politically. Sure, we had a competition with the uh, Soviet Union, the Cold War, but we know who won that one. With that being said, there is a point when every great empire start to face decline and collapses from within. And the reason behind that is maintaining the status of an empire is really, really hard. Number one, it costs a lot. Number two, it causes the leaders of the empire to ignore domestic issues in favor of maintaining the status of the empire. And in doing that, they end up ignoring the economic calamities and the suffering, the human suffering that happens within the borders of the empire. Society becomes, as a result, divided, angry, envious, and that causes a lot of societal disruptions, conflicts, from within, and the empire collapses. And ladies and gentlemen, what we see here in the United States of America right now, perhaps we're witnessing the beginning of the decline of the greatest economic miracle that we have seen in the history of mankind. And when we go to the Wall of Worry, and we visit DC in the recent events and the threats of a government shutdown, it illustrates the decline of this empire. What are the priorities of this empire right now? And of course, if you've been worried about, oh, the government shutdown will crash the market, uh, barons say, don't worry about a government shutdown, the stock market will be fine. Same folks who told you, by the way, uh, on August 6th, the stock market's rally paused. It is time to buy the dip. And if you bought the dip, you got slaughtered, pure and simple. So what the hell do they know? But we have some good news or bad news, depending on how you're going to look at it. But the government shutdown right now has been averted. And per usual, of course, any problem we got in this country, instead of sitting down and solving the problem right now, we continue to kick the can down the road. 
How did we avert a government shutdown? The answer is the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, caved once again. And of course, now he's in hot water with his own party. Why did you cave so easily right now? Yet again, when you held the advantage, when you had the leverage, but Speaker McCarthy decided to surrender. Now we have the talk that maybe Kevin McCarthy will be ousted as Speaker of the House. We'll see what happens. But what was the holdup here? Why did we get really close of a government shutdown? Is it because of social security or health care or or anything that regards the American public, of course not. The government was on the verge of shutting down because of a debate of funding a foreign country called Ukraine. The new approach would leave behind aid to Ukraine. So that's not gonna happen anymore. That's what the compromise is. We pass the bill, we avert the shutdown, but no funding for Ukraine right now. And this is a White House priority opposed by a growing number of GOP lawmakers. But the plan would increase federal disaster assistance by $16 billion, meeting President Joe Biden's full request. The package was approved 335 to 91, with most Republicans and almost all Democrats supporting the bill. We're going to do our job, McCarthy said before the House vote. We're going to be the adults in the room we're going to keep the government open. So all of this talk about, oh, uh, we're conservative, fiscal conservatives, and uh, the government's spending like a drunken sailor, at the end of the day, he capitulated. He did nothing at all about it. The House measure would fund government at the current 2023 levels for 45 days through November 17, moving closer to the bipartisan approach in the Senate. But the Senate package would have added $6 billion for Ukraine to fight the war against Russia and $6 billion for U.S. disaster relief. So there's an equivalency here. $6 billion to Ukraine, $6 billion to America, and the people suffering from natural disasters, and some not so natural. But anyways, the Speaker of the House says, if somebody wants to remove me because they want to be the adult in the room, go ahead and try. But I think this country is too important. Is it really this country because this is unsustainable. At some point, we need a wake-up call. If we continue to avert any of these wake-up calls, be it the debt negotiation or shutting down the government, then when do we wake up? When do we have a moment to say, okay, what we're doing right now is unsustainable and it's going to lead to an economic disaster and perhaps the end, the beginning of the end of this country. We got to act right now. Sure, a government shutdown is disruptive. Flights will be canceled. Folks are not going to get paid. But how do you get the attention of the American public that this is insane? The national debt right now exceeds $33 trillion. And since the debt ceiling has been suspended in the last deal, the government added $3 trillion to the national debt, almost. This is insane. We're now going to get to the point of adding a trillion dollars a month in the national debt. Never mind, of course, the rise in interest rates and uh, how much the government will have to pay to maintain this debt. We're about to pay $1 trillion in servicing the debt alone. $1 trillion in paying interest rates. Again, this is unsustainable. You heard what the chairman of the Fed said back when he was saying, we are in an unsustainable path when it comes to the fiscal policy. And be it the Fed or market observers, when they say, why are we seeing uh, interest rates on bond yields? moving higher. Because the Fed is not raising rates anymore, the Fed paused. But these rates continue to skyrocket and they cause all kind of problems in the stock market, all kind of problems in the economy. Because as rates go higher, we're going to start to pay more for everything. Mortgages, loans, car payments, credit card payments, even though the Fed did not really raise rates. But the recent move in bond yields is the equivalent of 50 to 75 basis points worth of hikes by the Fed. How did that happen if the Fed wasn't raising rates. And the answer could be, oh, China's dumping bonds, Japan is bu dumping bonds, uh, Saudi Arabia is dumping bonds. But in reality, why are we seeing yields skyrocketing right now? The answer is the unsustainable path of the fiscal policy. Without raising taxes, I mean, taxes are already high. How do you plug all of this uh, budget deficit that we see, all of this insane spending on steroids? The answer is you got to issue more and more bonds. When you increase the supply of bonds to fund the government, now you owe a debt to foreign nations, such as China, such as Japan, such as whatever. And increasing the supply of bonds lowers the price, which increases the yield. In other words, for these foreign governments to hold U.S. debt, they're asking for higher rates. Your country's now in shambles. You're spending like a drunken sailor. I'm not going to hold your debt for 10 to 30 years without getting a decent rate, a higher rate, because your economic house is out of order. And this is why the real reason we see bond yields going higher. But of course, the propaganda in the media and the economists, so-called economists, that is, they would say, oh, the U.S. debt is nearly 33 trillion, but uh, 
it's not really that bad. Everything is propaganda right now. They tell you that inflation is not really going higher. Inflation is done. It's actually crashing. Oh, and if gasoline prices go higher, that's actually good for the economy. Oh, bond yields are going higher. That's a great indicator for the economy. It's, it says that the economy is going to grow faster. All bullshit. And in reality, we are facing an economic reckoning here. The $33 trillion of debt right now is roughly the value of the GDP of the economies of China, Japan, Germany, India, and United Kingdom combined. The national debt right now is the equivalent of $252,000 per household or $99,000 per individual American. This is insane. And the fact that we're threatening a government shutdown because of funding of a foreign nation that we're going to spend, we already spent $100 billion in funding them. Now they want to spend another $100 billion while well, we have all of these problems going on in the economy right now. Just listen to the speech by President Biden today and notice how many times he says Ukraine versus America. Take a look. Although the Speaker and overwhelming majority of the Congress have steadfastly supported Ukraine to defend itself against the aggression and brutality of the Russians' attack on women and children in addition to the military in Ukraine. Uh, there's no Ukraine funding in this agreement. Despite that, I did not believe we could let millions of Americans go through the pain of a government shutdown. Oh, how generous of you. Your priority is the American people, not Ukraine. Ukraine comes after that. But of course, I mean, you'll hear the speech, the rest of it, and be honest. Tell me what his priorities are. Take a look. But let's be clear. I hope my friends on the other side keep their word about support for Ukraine. They said they're going to support Ukraine in a separate vote. We cannot, under any circumstance, allow American support for Ukraine to be interrupted. I fully expect the Speaker to keep his commitment to secure the passage and support needed to help Ukraine as they defend themselves against aggression and brutality. And folks, uh, you know, overwhelmingly, there's overwhelming number of Republicans and Democrats in both the House and the Senate who support Ukraine. Let's vote on it. And I want to assure our American allies and the American people and the people of Ukraine that you can count on our support. We will not walk away. And of course, it would not be a Biden speech without a brain freeze moment. Take a look. But are you worried that he is going to be forced by fellow Republicans to back away from any deal he cuts with you? I hope this experience for the speaker has been one of a personal revelation. I'm not being facetious. I, uh, um, Now, the good news for President Biden and the Democrats is we have a lot of corrupt Republicans who are going to join them and they're going to pass a large, huge bill to fund Ukraine. Not just what the White House asked for. Oh, the Republicans will add more to it, billions and billions more. Here is uh, from South Carolina, Senator Lean V. Graham. Take a look. But I'm not worried about the next six weeks. I'm worried about next year. We will produce in the United States Senate Ukraine funding 60 or 70 billion, not 24, to get them through next year. So he just admitted here that this war is going to last for more than a year. And we're going to continue to pour more and more and more money into it. Billions and billions of dollars. Not just uh, 20 billion, but 70 billion. And when they say 70 billion, it's going to be 100 billion. Okay, so we're going to spend 100 billion dollars per year in funding the war in Ukraine. Is this the education department, the health department? No, it's not. It's $100 billion per year that will go to a foreign country to fund a war. And we know what the war is all about. It's not that, oh, Ukraine is such a democracy. If it falls down, uh, America is going to fall down. It's, hey, we got the biggest dick in the world. We're number one. We're the empire. And here, Russia, China, anybody. You want to play tough? You want to start seizing territory and accumulating resources? Watch out. We'll show you. That's what it's all about. The problem is, as we show you to Russia and China, we're spending billions and billions of dollars and we're ignoring the problems that are brewing here domestically in this country. Take, for example, what's going on with the inflation that's going on right now. They gaslight us and say, oh, inflation is gone. It's cooling off. No, it's not. If it is, then how do you explain all of these labor strikes that are going on? It's not because they're greedy. It's because they're suffering from brutal inflation and the wages. They're not really catching up with the price of utilities, rents, mortgages, car payments, 
the gas station, the grocery store, and they're striking, demanding higher wages. The CEOs, the executives, the investor class, oh, they're doing fine. They use the revenues to buy back stocks, to prop up the valuation of these stocks higher. They get to dump, securing billions of billions of dollars. They hand the bag to the retail mom and pop investors who lose their money. It's a wealth exchange, really. Instead of spending the money on R&D and making sure that this country is going to have a moat, that's how great empires maintain their status, by being way ahead of the game, not by fighting all of these wars. But the working class of America is not really feeling any of the prosperity that we see in Wall Street or in the C-suite or the investor class, the owner class. And now we have the UAW with a massive strike that is intensifying and getting worse right now. And of course, all of these workers see the threat that's coming. In the case of the Hollywood strike, it was AI. In the case of the UAW strike, it's EVs. They know what's going to happen here. As we transition to so-called green energy and electric vehicles, they're not going to save the environment. That's not what it's all about. They're going to save more money in their pockets. We're talking about the executives, the CEOs, the investors. Because EVs require 40% less jobs. There's no combustion engine here. So you're going to let go of all of that department. If EVs were really uh, environmentally friendly or, or all about the environment and saving the planet, then why are we chopping forests, depleting water resources, blowing up mountains to extract the nickel and copper and lithium that EV batteries require? How is that environmentally friendly? How is that saving the planet? There was an article in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend, and it reads $67 billion of rare minerals is buried under one of the world's biggest carbon sinks. That's in Canada. So if you want to extract all of that wealth, the nickel and uh, the copper and lithium and all of that, you got to chop the hell out of the forest here and deplete all of these water resources. Again, how is this saving the planet? Is it really about saving the planet or it's about saving a buck? And again, in reality, the problems that we have here domestically when it comes to inflation is we're paying more and more in the cost of insurance. And of course, uh, the uh, insurance companies will use climate change as an excuse to raise those premiums. Oh, we have risk of climate change now, and we got to raise your premiums. But we see that the natural disasters with a 1 billion plus in losses is actually increasing. And the question now becomes, if you listen to the insurance companies, it is increasing because of climate change. We're seeing more disasters. But is it really or because the Fed inflated the value of these properties by printing an insane amount of money and creating a bubble? In other words, is it really that disasters are increasing in frequency or is it the value of the properties lost being inflated by the Fed? And this is why we see more and more $1 billion plus worth of losses from natural disasters. Something you got to think about. But the conclusion at the end of the day doesn't matter. We're paying more and more for insurance. An arm and a leg. For example, the insurance cost for multifamily residences has almost doubled in about a decade or so. When we look at the auto insurance inflation rate, it is at the highest level since the 1970s. It is exploding out of control right now. So you can't afford a home because mortgage rates are exploding higher and home prices continue to stay higher and there is no supply. So owning a home is pretty much impossible. Now owning a vehicle is becoming also impossible. The prices are way too high. The cost of gas is way too high. The cost of insurance is way too high. The average payment right now for a used car, not a new one, for a used car is exceeding $600 per month. This is insane. And this is unsustainable. Something got to give here. We look at health insurance cost. It has been skyrocketing. I mean, it's a scam to begin with. Uh, go ask any of your friends from uh, Germany or Canada or Australia and tell them that I pay $500 a month for health insurance cost. But when I get sick, there is a deductible. I have to pay $7,000 or sometimes $10,000 out of pocket before the policy kicks in. So what am I paying a monthly premium for if at the end of the day I have to pay from my pocket? But of course, we don't think like that in this country because they're keeping us mummified and zombified with the Prozac and the Xanax and the Adderall. The population right now is zombified. They can't even think anymore. They're so numb. Nobody asks questions anymore. Why the hell am I paying this much for health insurance cost? At the end of the day, when I get sick, I have to pay for my pocket. But the point being here is health insurance cost is skyrocketing. It's becoming a major problem. And it's not just the UAW that is striking right now. We know what's going on with Kaiser Permanente. About 70,000 workers about to go on strike. And now we have the Culinary Union in uh, Las Vegas about to strike. 
And this could be a big one. We know what's going on with casino revenues through the roof. The stack of MGM has been exploding higher until recently. Uh, the nation is gambling like we've never seen before. But the workers are not getting a taste. The executives are. They, they're dumping stacks. They're making a lot of money. But the workers are not getting a taste of the success of the casinos right now. The culinary and bartender union said late Tuesday that 95% of its members voted to give the union leadership the authority to call a strike for about 53,000 Las Vegas housekeepers, bartenders, and other workers if a deal is not reached. The culinary union has not yet set a strike deadline and said it continues to negotiate in good faith with the gambling companies. There is no guarantee that a strike will occur. But the leader of the union says, if these gambling companies don't come to an agreement, the workers have spoken and we will be ready to do whatever it takes up to and including a strike. Workers are now seeking five-year contracts that include the largest wage increases ever negotiated in the history of the culinary union. And the last time Las Vegas strip workers walked off the job was in 1984, with 17,000 culinary union members on strike for 67 days. Listen to this. The culinary and bartender unions represent 60,000 workers in Nevada. So this could be a big one, and it could paralyze the casino industry here in Las Vegas. And if the union is listening right now and they haven't set a deadline or a date for the strike, how about strike Las Vegas, most importantly the casino companies, where it really hurts? And that's when the stupid F1 race comes to town. You see, for one event, the Formula One race, they closed all the streets. They're destroying the city, really. They chopped these beautiful trees in the Bellagio. They've been standing here since the 1990s. They chopped them off to build these stupid stands for the Formula One race. And then they say, oh, we're going to put the trees back. How do you put them back? With the glue? You chop them off. I mean, look how beautiful it was. The city is hot. The tourists, they need shade. The trees produce oxygen. They're going to chop all of this for a bunch of stupid stands for the F1 race. And they're going to chop more and more trees, more and more destruction, because this contract is going to last for 10 years now. So I say the culinary union, you better hit Las Vegas when the F1 race comes to town. Paralyze the entire city. And the casino bosses will come down begging on their knees to hand you a nice contract. But at the end of the day, all of these labor strikes, the resolution would be a negotiated agreement in which wages are going higher. And as wages go higher, that's inflationary. Gas prices will go higher. Rent prices will go higher. Home prices will go higher. You're going to pay more in utility bills. You're going to pay more for everything. And again, we are on an unsustainable path, be it in the fiscal policy or the monetary policy. Something got to give here. Otherwise, we're heading for a major accident in this economy. And of course, the accident in the economy usually is preceded by an accident in the stock market. So the stock market crashes, then we see the economy suffering. And maybe if you're uh, bullish the stock market, you should be upset that the government averted a shutdown because in recent years, government shutdowns produced uh, sizable gains for the S&P 500, about 10% in 2019. But again, as we segue from the economy to the stock market, we know that the month of October is supposedly good from a seasonality perspective. September was bad, now we have October. And honestly, when you look at all of these statistics, it's bullshit, really. We know that the stock market is a Ponzi scheme. It's uh, being fed every single month with billions and billions of dollars from retirement funds, pension funds, because the retirement system in this country relies on a higher stock market. You got to feed the scheme and the stock market goes higher. If you're pumping more money into it, it goes higher. So all of these statistics are bullshit, but the stock market this year has been following the seasonality to the penny, almost uh, as a script. And the robots, of course, doing the majority of the trading, so they follow the script. And according to the script, the month of October is actually a good month for the stock market. And you can see whether we look at since 1950 or the past 20 years, the past 10 years, the past five years, the month of October is usually a rebound month from an ugly September. We got an ugly September. Now the bet is we'll see a rebound in the month of October. But the question now becomes, what stocks will lead the rebound if it happens to begin with? If the answer is energy stocks, and I'm still bullish energy, but that would be a bad indicator for the stock market and the economy because it means that only inflation-related stocks are moving higher. Are we going to see the so-called Magnificent Seven rebounding and leading a market rally in October? Because so far, since the month of uh, August, they're all down. Of course, led by Apple, which is the most important stock, down about 12.5% in about two months. And unlike the first half of the year, when we saw stocks such as uh, industrials or retail or transportation, all of them rallied along with the Magnificent Seven, a.k.a. the AI mania. They lagged, of course, but then at some point they played catch up. But if you see the performance since the month of August, 
they're all down. Transportation, a leading indicator for the economy, down about 12.5%, similar to Apple. You gotta pay attention now. Transportation, Apple, all of these are leading indicators for the market and the economy. The XRT retail is down about 10%. The XLI industrial is down about 8%. So when the pumpers say that, oh, this is still a bull market, it has been a bull market. I would say, of course, it's a bear market rally. It's an excessive one, historically speaking, but at the end of the day, it is a bear market rally. But if you say that this is a bull market, then explain to me why we're not seeing small caps, retail businesses, transportation leading the gains in this so-called bull market rally. Why is it limited to seven stocks, now down to five? And again, if you're betting that this is a bull market, then who's going to lead the rebound? We have to rebound in the month of October because the pumpers say that, oh, September is just seasonal. The weakness that we've seen in the month of September is seasonal. Okay, then show me the money. Rebound in the month of October. Go back to the highs and then I'll believe you. But which set of stocks will lead the rebound? If the AI mania is fading away, if transportation is not doing so hot so, if industrials are not doing so hot so, if retail is collapsing, even the strongest sector of the economy, I would argue housing that's also given up right now whether we look at Pulte, toll brothers kb home all going down now why because we go back to the conversation of the reckless fiscal policy the yield on the 30-year bond made a new high and the moment it made a new high we saw these home builders if you look at the xhp in uh, orange the home builder index or the itb in blue the construction index and then you got the 30-year yield in white. The moment we saw a new high in the 30-year, these stocks began to give up. And the reason is, as the 30-year moves higher, mortgage rates will move higher. At some point, that's going to slow down home builders, regardless of the lack of supply, because nobody can afford the... <laughs> nobody can afford these mortgages, folks. Anyhow, before we talk about the market, let's uh, set it up here with a review of the morning brief that I issued in Discord this last Friday. It was actually a midday brief. It was not a morning brief, but I said good morning, afternoon. The oversold rebound is showing significant sign of weakness and the market move by the close will be very important. So let's identify the setup here. If we look at the Dixie, the hourly chart forming a cup and handle formation and also showing oversold readings on the hourly chart that are being corrected as the MACD starts to show bullish green candles in the histogram. If the Dixie recaptures 106.318 basis points again, the market will begin to fade significantly. Here's the chart that I gave you at the time, an hourly chart. You can see the beginning of a cup and handle formation. And here's the update. The dollar went higher, not quite to 106.318, but moving higher at that point added a lot of pressure on the equities market. We'll see that in a minute, but back to the morning brief. The 10-year yield and hourly chart. We see that the chart rebounded from 4.509 basis points and crossed above a sloping resistance level. This is bullish for the 10-year and suggests that if the hourly chart MACD confirms bullish momentum by crossing and producing uh, green candles on the histogram, we will see the market fade in reaction. Here's the chart that I gave you, and here's the update. You can see that we got a crossing in the MACD indicator. That was a confirmation that yields are going higher, at least for that particular day, and equities will fade. We go back to the morning brief. The VIX is an important indicator, folks, not just the dollar in the 10-year. And read the VIX, the hourly chart. I said, looking at the hourly MACD, it appears that the VIX is bottoming, at least attempting to recapture 17.08 support. And if it does, the market will fade. And here's the chart that I gave you for the VIX. Notice that the uh, hourly MACD was bottoming and about to cross and the chart was below 17.08 the most critical level here here's the update the VIX made it above and recaptured that level of support and you see the confirmation in the MACD and this move alone caused a lot of problems in the stock market on Friday but back to the morning brief SPY 15 minutes it could not there's a typo here it could not close above the most important line at least for now 430 also the chart is losing a steep bullish support line and forming a bear flag pattern I think it falls to 428 then 426 here's the SPY the chart that I gave you you can see that it lost 430 that was a bad sign to begin with sort of a gap and crap then it consolidated in a bear flag pattern and here's the update not only the SPY lost 428 as support but it went down to 426 and kept that as support for now but again it is a significant sign of weakness here back to the morning brief the Q's 15 minutes I said lost the support of 361 and lost a steep bullish support line. Now forming a bear flag pattern. I think we might revisit 357 as support again. And this is the chart that I gave you. You can see that the Q's midday Friday lost 361.40 in a gap and crap and lost a really steep bullish trend line forming a bear flag pattern. Here's the update. Not only the Q's went down and lost 358.68, but it went down and retest pretty much to the penny of 357. Managed to close above. That's the good news. 
The bad news is, there is no confirmation that the Qs will not go down and lose the most important line, 357 again. So with that setup out of the way, let's talk about the market folks and we begin with the closing of the indices last Friday and uh, here we go. On Friday, the Dow Industrial Average was negative by 158.84 points or a decline of 0.47%. The Nasdaq closing positive barely at 18.05 points or a gain of 0.14%. S&P 500 in the red by 11.65 points or a decline of 0.27%. We'll look at the sectors on Friday, all negative with exception of uh, cyclicals at number one, technology at number two, real estate, Utilities was a little bit positive, but again, no major gains here. And of course, energy was the laggard on Friday. And this is really important. Is it just an anomaly or a leading indicator for an upcoming underperformance by energy in the weeks to come? Because you got to understand this. The market right now has three enemies. Enemy number one, bond yields. And there's little we can do about that. And then you have the dollar, enemy number two. And there's little we can do about that because it's all about the reckless monetary and fiscal policy. But enemy number three is energy prices. And if energy starts to cool off, and we see the prices of crude going down, then that could be the relief that the market needs to stage an October rebound. Whether it's going to last or not, that's a different story, but at least ignite the spark for an October rebound. When we contrast this with the weekly performances for the sector, we see that energy is actually at number one, and the only sector that managed to close in the green decisively. Sure, we have technology by a tick, communication services by a tick, but it was all about energy, and the rest got annihilated. Look at utilities down almost six and a half percent for the week defensives down big real estate down big why the answer is bond yields are going higher utilities defensives real estate all of these are dividend paying sectors if the risk-free rate is paying you more and more and more then why bother holding utilities or defensives or real estate for the dividend when you're assuming a lot of risk now there was a point where these sectors and one would argue that at least utilities became excessively oversold and they're due for a rebound but if bond yields continue to go higher these stocks will continue to suffer when we look at the breadth on friday it was almost neutral here nyse 39 percent advancing versus 59 percent declining for the nasdaq a little better 50 percent advancing versus 46 percent declining so we can go anywhere from here breadth wise of course we'll talk about the technicals and otherwise in a minute but let's see how commodities did on friday and when we look at that we see red across the board for the most part we don't have any major move by the dollar that could prompt a reaction like this across the board but my assumption is we've seen some profit taking in commodities throughout the week not all of them but some of them you see grains down big you look at wheat down about six and a half percent on friday uh, when you look at metals down across the board with exception of copper so is copper saying something here really hard to say is copper predicting that the dollar is going to go down really hard to say right now you look at the overwhelming evidence with the silver and gold down big at least silver was down big massive reversal here we'll look at the charts in a minute but they say that maybe the dollar is not done and dr copper has been wrong a lot of times when we look at softs down across the board, the exception is OJ Futures. Orange Juice has been on fire. Uh, believe it or not, Orange Juice is a uh, luxury now because the supply is getting absolutely killed. Literally, the diseases, the weather, it's really hard to grow citrus right now. And therefore, we see Orange Juice prices going higher. Now, when it comes to energy, down across the board, the exception is heating oil was up about half a percentage point, but notice the gasoline RBOB was down almost 3% for the session. On the other hand, Brent or WTI were both down about 1% apiece. But we see a really interesting phenomenon here. You see in orange, we have crude oil prices. In white, we have the gasoline R Bob. There is a correlation here. They trade together. But recently, we've seen a massive divergence here. The orange line, crude oil is moving higher. And then we see the R Bob in white moving down. So what's up with that? We've seen it before last year, briefly, of course. And this was really good for refiner stocks, such as Valero, Marathon. Those kind of stocks did pretty good here. As we see the gap between crude oil prices versus the gasoline R Bob widens. And that's good for the margins of refiners, but... It is really suspicious here. What's going on? Is our Bob saying something about crude or is crude saying something about our Bob? Or do we have a simple case of manipulation here? If they can't control the price of crude because OPEC Plus controls that, they can control the gasoline our Bob. And that's perhaps more important when it comes to the gasoline prices at the pump that you and I pay. So if we want to give the American public some relief and you can't really drop oil prices down, how about you manipulate gasoline our Bob down? And now you might think, oh my God, Maverick, this is a tinfoil hat theory. Well, then explain to me the constant manipulation of commodity prices, be it gold, be it silver, be it uh, other commodities. All of this has been revealed uh, 
In the case of gold, you have JP Morgan, for example, been manipulating the price of gold for years. And they had to pay fines for doing so. The traders went to jail for a little bit, of course. They manipulate, they make money, they get a slap on the wrist and then they get out. But anyhow, for the week, the performance for commodities was mixed. We see lumber at top along with orange juice, natural gas, heating oil, crude oil, Brent, the WTI, all among the gainers for the week. The laggards, led by uh, grains for the most part, and metals. So we see silver, soybean oil, wheat, all at the bottom, along with, of course, the now curious case of the gasoline RBOB. We move on to the options market, the big casino. What do we see here on Friday? The volume is still shy. It went higher for specific names, mainly Tesla and NVIDIA. And that tells me right off the gate that we see more participation once again by the retail mom and pops. Maybe they have seen a day or two worth of a rebound comes Friday. They felt, okay, it's safe right now to buy some calls on Tesla and NVIDIA. And hence, we see the volume moving higher for these two names. But regardless, we see the put to call ratio becoming more in balance. We see buying of puts now. And let's go back and hear what I said a few weeks ago when the correction began about the put to call ratio and then come back. When we look at the five days average put to call ratio, calls were extremely outweighing puts in the month of July. And then we bought them. We called that in this program. The moment we bought them, we start seeing buying of puts. That's the moment when the market is going to top and starts to go down. And now we're back at the neutral line, one to one, 50 50. Can we dip down a little bit and we see more buying of calls? We see the market rebanding and then we see more buying of puts because of Jackson Hole, because of NVIDIA, because of whatever. We explode higher. We puts way outweigh calls. And then we know that we're in the climax. We have perhaps a more sustainable, a more more tradable rebound than the one we got on Friday. And here's the update, folks, pretty much to the penny of the outlook from this channel. We went back to the neutral line. We saw steep declines in the stock market. A lot of folks said, OK, it's time to buy calls now. This is the bottom. And I told you it's going to be a trap. So we see the call ratio improving over puts. We see a dip down in the chart. But then what happened? Exactly how I told you it's going to play out. We will see the resumption of buying puts getting us above the neutral line of one. And the correction is not over. We're going to go down even more. And now comes the question. What do we do from here? Is this enough? Is the ratio of puts to calls elevated enough? to create a rebound and a bottoming process in the market? My hunch is not quite. We're getting close, but we need one more big pop where the five days average of put to calls becomes really elevated as we've seen during the SVB collapse this year and right around December of last year. And then we get somewhat of a more reliable rebound than the ones we've been getting so far. Anyhow, moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday, not a lot because the traders were not active absent of uh, Tesla and NVIDIA. But we have some interesting trades here. The first one is for Amazon, AMZN. Now, the name went down big in the last couple of weeks. Somebody here is betting for a big rebound. Matter of fact, they're betting that Amazon will rally by more than 7.5% by the expiration date of November 3rd. This is why they bought the 137 calls, spending about 2.5 bucks a pop. All in all, they spent about $1 million in buying these calls. We'll see what happens, but we have BURL. This is for the Burlington factory, which is the only stock that I shorted this year. I have a bunch of other shorts from uh, the year before, but this is the only one I initiated this year. And the reason is the debt is too high. Retail businesses will have to face higher interest rates. And as demand slows down, you have to identify what retail businesses at most risk here. And the name Burlington Factory comes among the top. So here we have somebody betting for more pain to come for this name. They bought the 120 puts for the expiration date, November 17th, with expectations that BURL will go down even more and lose about 11% or more of its value by then. Paid about two bucks a piece, tenor. This trade, all in all, spending about $650,000. We look at the heat map from Friday. What do we see here? Obviously, energy was the laggard, but we see some rebounds that played out on Friday and stuck, mostly in technology. And the way I explain this is we've seen two days worth of rebounds before Friday. And I think a lot of traders comes Friday, dip their toes a little bit in buying the dips in these names. Number one. Number two, we got options expiration on Friday. So the names that went down the most get to rebound as the market maker plays their games. And the names that went higher the most for the week, in this case, energy, they go down on Friday because the market maker wants the maximum amount of calls and puts to expire in the money. Among the notable decliners, of course, we have banks. JP Morgan was down about one and a qu three quarters of a percent, excuse me, in uh, Berkshire Hathaway with a downgrade down about 2% for the session. That's, uh, I would say, rare. 
for Berkshire Hathaway to be downgraded, and it goes down about 2% for the day. Healthcare lagged, the industrials lagged, some of the big caps also lagged, Google, Meta, for example. A Walmart, notable weakness here on Friday, down about a little over 1.5%. But we see some signs of life, at least on Friday, in utilities, in REITs, in... Um, staples a little bit all of these are dividend paying names but if yields go higher again we're talking about bond yields here it's going to be really hard to see any sustainable rebound in these sectors they're going to catch oversold rebounds i'm talking about utilities of course but the sustainability relies on bond yields going down and for now that's unforeseeable notable gainers on friday pfizer up a little over three percent what's up with that it's a dead dog whatever a rebound you get it fades away right away then we have nike we played uh, some call options lotto tickets before earnings buying calls on Nike, those produced massive gains on Friday because the name was really oversold. They gave us the trade on a silver platter here, folks. We had to take it. And let's say it produced a lot of steaks and lobsters, baby. Let's contrast all of this with the weekly heat map. And what we see here is quite the opposite. Notable weakness in the big caps. But we see chips doing pretty good this week, be it NVIDIA, be it AMD, Intel, Qualcomm, Taiwan all rebounding. So there are signs of life here that a lot of traders comes October, whether they believe in the seasonality or not, they're going to use the seasonality as an excuse to buy some of these dips. And of course, naturally, they're going to flock to the same names that have been performing since the year began, the AI mania. Now, I'm not really sure that that's going to be a wise choice as we head to the end of the year. I think it's going to be a different set of stocks that will continue to outperform. We see energy, for example, leading the pack for the week we see a lot of these lagging sectors if we hit a financial accident such as utilities absolutely hammered this week dividend paying sectors such as staples defensives such as healthcare such as some of the communication names horizon at&t along with some names in real estate not all of them though you gotta avoid the offices all of these dividend paying sectors will start to improve if we begin to see a financial accident a recession type indicator that drops the value of the dollar, most importantly, bond yields. If that happens, then these sectors will lead. But if inflation continues to rev higher, then forget about buying the dip in chips and the big caps. They're not going to hold. What's going to hold is energy and energy alone. Now, the banks is a dead zone. You avoid that. That's You just leave it alone. Because the systemic risk event will come from banks and other financial-related assets. When I look at the map all in all, I see a lot of weakness. I see some rebounds in terms of option plays with the retail mom and pops in Tesla, in the big names, in NVIDIA and AMD. But then I look at Apple, and Apple is down 2% for the week. As Apple goes, so will the market. This is why we need to see a bottom in Apple, a reliable bottom, before we begin and say, okay, you got to start buying the dips in technology. Otherwise, all of these rebands will be proven to be unsustainable and short-lived. We look at the weekly heat map for the ETFs. What do we see here? In a week where the dollar exploded higher and bond yields also did the same, look at the TLT down about 3%. You're not going to see a lot of green here. We see energy leading XOP, XLE, okay. But then we have, I would say, oversold rebounds in sectors such as uh, SMH chips in the XRT retail. Thank you, Nike, of course. The KRE regional banks. Some rebounds, those are not really reliable with the dollar bond yields and the VIX moving higher. Once they start to go down, then you look at the map here and say, who is the biggest loser here? It's called Miners GDX. It's the Silver SLV. It's the XLU Utilities. And these are the kind of sectors that are going to pick up if we start to see a meaningful top with plenty of confirmation in bond yields and the dollar. For now, we don't have that. But let's look at the charts and see if they offer us something new. We begin with the SPY, the S&P 500 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? Of course, now that we have the government shutdown averted, you're going to see uh, rebounds overnight. Whether these rebounds going to be short-lived or uh, in a gap and crap fashion in the morning, that's besides the point. I don't want you to look at the futures right now and make assumptions. I want you to look at the charts and the setup we got in Friday's closing. What we see here is the S&P kept 426 to support. That's the good news. Bad news is why couldn't the SPY make it above 430 and close above 430? Because it's making a higher low for now. You can argue that there's a higher low. But losing 430 opens the possibility for a topping head and shoulder pattern. Now, there's a possibility that this could be a bear trap. How could it be, Maverick? How about the market maker playing games on Friday? In the last couple of days before Friday, we've seen a rebound. So the assumption is a lot of folks bought calls with the weekly expiration, buying a lotto ticket. The market maker says, uh, 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 I'm not going to let you win here. I'll do a gap and crap on Friday, flush all of you down. Then I'm going to suck a bunch of bears in. We're going to buy puts, assuming that the rebound is over, and then kill them on Monday. 
with a rebound. And this is why I said there is no confirmation here for us to play shorts again and buy puts, initiate new ones. I said that repeatedly on Discord, on the live streams, on the show, until we close below 426, and we did not get that. Likewise, you're not going to go ahead and buy new calls right now until we see the SPY recapturing and closing above 430. We look at the daily chart for the e-mini futures. What do we see here? The answer is we are within range here. We're keeping 4,300 as support. And my expectations are 4,300 should produce at least some rebound. If the chart loses 4,300 support, then this shows significant weakness. And it means we're heading down to 4,200. One would argue that this could happen still because what we're seeing right now is a bear flag pattern. One would argue maybe an inverse ABC pattern. Regardless of the pattern, we lose 4,300. We close below that by the end of the day and understand that the chart is seeking support from a lower ground and that ground would be 4200 on the other hand the chart will not be out of the woods until it closes on daily basis above 4384 and a half so right now it's a battlefield you lose the support we have more pain to come you capture the resistance you got gains to come look at the spx the cash index what do we see here in the daily chart closed below 4300 that's bad news at least bad news for the bulls good news for the bears but we're gonna make a federal case based on our Closing slightly below 4,300, maybe, but maybe not. I would say I would consider it as a sign of weakness. Why couldn't the algos close us above 4,300? Could be because a lot of folks bought calls at the 4,300 level and the market maker wanted them to lose, perhaps. And in this case, it's, it's a trap. It's a bear trap. And higher we go tomorrow. But if it's not, then what if it is an inverse ABC pattern? And we're heading down to 4200. So Monday's opening will be really, really important. Okay, the shutdown is not happening. Now you got to prop these stocks higher. We got to go above 4300 and close above it comfortably. Otherwise, if we see the chart gapping and cramping and losing 4300, understand that we have an inverse ABC pattern playing out here all the way down to 4200. And why is 4200 really important? The answer is if we we plug in the 200 days moving average it is exactly sitting at 4200 pretty much to the penny now i would say we go down there and i would be more comfortable to say okay now the vix went higher now the five days put to calls ratio exploded higher now we're at 4200 now we're at the support of the 200 days moving average you gotta at least see some sustainable rebound here. It would be a more of a reliable point for me to buy some calls bidding on a rebound than right now. If we clean up the chart and we use the 150 days moving average in blue this time around, that's another indicator you gotta watch on Monday. If the chart loses the 150 days moving average, then understand we're going down to 4200 and we're going down to the 200 days moving average. We look at the weekly chart for the SPX, the cash index. We were looking for an inverse ABC pattern. We got it now. Can it go a little uh, further down? The answer is yes. And we have the 50 weeks moving average sitting at around, you guessed it again, 4,200. Is it a plausible scenario that we go down to 4,200? Absolutely. Look at the uh, momentum indicators, the RSI, the MACD, they're all showing us plenty of room here. If the SPX wants to go down, it has plenty of room to go down. If we switch to a monthly chart for the cash index, what do we see here? We see that we've been trading in the channel of lower lows, and lower highs and the chart is losing a lot of momentum right now and i would say that the january 22 was the top of the everything bubble and that's done now since then we've been in a bear market rally since the year began but really since the october bottom but what if we have a bear market rally top right now and in my book it has been confirmed by the negative closing in the month of september if that is the case then we have to play the channel here and go all the way to the lower end of the channel forming a lower low now, this is a monthly chart. It's not going to play tomorrow. But if this outlook stands, then uh, whatever we got this year is indeed a bear market rally. And the AI mania will fade. We're going to see some sort of a systemic event. We will go back forming a lower low in the pattern. But one step at a time, folks. We'll look at the Qs, the NASDAQ, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? Again, the fact that the chart lost plenty of support lines during the session on Friday is not really a good sign here. We've seen a rebound the last two days. Now, it could be explained that all oh, the market makers are just playing some games here, making those weekly calls expire out of the money and then we go higher again sure i get that and it could be supported by the fact that the queues closed above the most important line 357 right now but again the action on friday could uh, at least in the eyes of bears form a topping head and shoulder pattern so in monday's trading you gotta watch 357 if we have a gap and crap and we go down we lose 357 understand that we're going down and we're going down big 
we're going to make lower lows. If the chart closes above 361.40, then understand that it was a trap on Friday, a bear trap. We have more gains to come, perhaps all the way to 367. Absent of that, losing 357 will confirm that we have an inverse ABC pattern. Now, if we switch to the daily chart of the queues this time around, and we use the 100 days moving average in blue, we went exactly in a retest in this rebound, the 100 days moving average. And it was a rejection so far. In other words, you're not buying anything right now until the queues closes above the 100 days moving average. Otherwise, down we go. And if we look at the daily chart for the NASDAQ futures, what do we see here? We see a failure to recapture 15,000 of support. That is a dooming sign. It's not a good sign. But without confirmation yet, then we're going to go lower. The confirmation would be losing 14,675. Once again, whatever rebound we get overnight, unless it closes above 15,000, the momentum is on the side of bears or more downside coming. If we look at the NASDAQ 100, the NDX daily chart, what do we see here? We talked about a rebound to fill the gap and retest the 100 days moving average. We got both now, but it was met with failure, yet with no confirmation. You see the rejection, but you don't see the confirmation, which is the loss of 14,672.85 for support. That did not happen yet. Keyword yet. Why is this line important? The answer is, it is the neckline in a topping head and shoulder pattern. You lose that line, you got a confirmation that we got a rejection, a clean one. 100 days moving average, we filled the gap above, so that means we have lower lows coming here. If you look at the NDX, the NASDAQ 100, on a weekly chart perspective, where we're looking for an inverse ABC pattern, we got that, but it's not finished yet. If it wants to go down more, it can. It has plenty of room in the MACD and the RSI to go down and become really oversold from a weekly chart perspective. Now, I'm giving you a lot of confirmation points here for your taste before you start buying anything here. You're not buying shit until the Q's closes above the 100 days moving average. You're not buying shit until the SPX closes above 4300. You're not buying shit until the NDX closes above the 20 weeks moving average. Otherwise, you got no confirmations at all. And of course, you got to watch the VIX, the dollar, and bond yields. We'll talk about that in a minute, but let's do the IWM here, the Russell 2000 daily chart. What do we see here? To begin with, what do you see in white is the 20 days moving average. And it's now crossing below the blue line, which is the 200 days moving average. That is a bearish sign. We call this a death cross, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter to me. But it means that this chart is weak and you're not buying it right now, regardless of the rebounds. We got a rebound target at filling the gap. We filled the gap right now, kind of. We can go all the way in a retest to the 20 moving averages. 181.61 if it wants to go higher. But we have no confirmation that this is the bottom. And of course, any reversal from here, any loss of 176.24 will mean that we have lower lows coming in the pattern. But folks, the most important chart to watch is the dollar. And right now, the dollar on Thursday gave us a reversal pattern, a bearish engulfing pattern. Friday, here comes the games. We see a bottoming pattern. So which one is it? We know that the dollar is overbought. We know it's due for a revisit to the 20 days moving average. The question is when? Because if you're betting on that right now, you're buying equities right now, or you're buying gold right now, what if it continues to go higher? What if it continues to expand the Bollinger Bands higher? And then later on, it flushes down to the 20 days moving average. That's the problem here in buying anything right now. Without the dollar going down for good, we have no clear signal here. If we zoom into an hourly chart, we talked about the cup and handle formation. Right now, it appears that the dollar wants to go higher. And this is not a good sign for the equities market and certainly not a good sign for precious metals. Now, when we look at the weekly chart for the dollar, using Fibonacci lines, we see the number number 107.178 basis points. That is the 50% retracement line. I think that would be significant if we have more gains to come for the dollar. Watch this number. It could stop the dollar. And then we have a permission to begin thinking about buying some stocks, but most importantly, precious metals, in this case, gold and gold miners. Look at the chart of the old man gold. What do we see here? Massive flush down, massive failure, oversold, due for a rebound, but with no confirmation. The dollar continues to go higher. Gold will continue to flush down, regardless of any oversold rebound. You can see the phenomenon of gold rebounding along with the dollar going higher. But that means it's an oversold rebound and gold will go down again. We have 1819 as the next support. Now you look at the weekly chart for gold. What do we see here? Sloping line of resistance, rejection, massive damn candle indicates more pain to come. And the support in the weekly chart is 1809.48. You look at silver, massive, massive bearish engulfing candle here. Lost support at 20.45. And if we clean the chart right here, we have seen these massive bearish engulfing candles before. Some were followed by an oversold rebound, a reflex reaction, but at the end of the day, they lead to more decline. 
minds. The conclusion here, looking at gold and silver, if we have more pain to come in precious metals, then the dollar is not done going higher. And if the dollar is not done going higher, we haven't seen the bottom in equities yet. When we look at UK oil, Brent oil, the daily chart, what do we see here? We see a sign of weakness now. And the reason is we see uh, a negative divergence in the RSI. We see negative momentum in the MACD indicator. We see a lower high. We see a loss of the 20 moving average. All of these are indicators that we have weakness here in crude oil. It doesn't say that we have a top. It doesn't say that it's not going to go higher later on. But we have to be really careful now. If this chart loses 90.28 of support, it will be a problem. You should have some puts in your energy exposure as insurance. Because if you have OPIC Plus saying something positive about supply this week, then this chart is going down. If somehow the drop in gasoline are bob is meant to drop crude oil prices, then that will be a bad sign. And you're going to need some insurance now. Has been a good rally for oil. But what is the point if you don't lock your gains? I'm not saying sell your stocks, because that's going to cost you a lot of taxes if you're not holding for more than a year. But hedge your position by buying some of these puts, because we could be in for an inverse ABC pattern again. If the chart cracks below 90.28, it's going to be a problem. You look at the XLE, the energy ETF. Once again, bearish engulfing candle. Lost the 20 MA. Negative divergences on the momentum indicators, the RSI and the MACD. The line in the sand is 89.14. You lose that, we have more pain to come for energy. And probably we've seen the top for the year. So you got to be extremely careful here. For now, we're just eyeing a correction in a bullish trend, maybe an inverse ABC pattern that takes us all the way down to 89.14. But you lose that, we got a problem. How about the daily chart for the two-year yield? We see it going down, lost an important support of 5.085%, forming a bear flag pattern that is playing out right now. And while the short end of the yield curve goes down, the long end continues to gain. And that is called yield curve steepening. Bearish yield curve steepening, which is usually accompanied by stock market weakness. You look at the 10 year, we got what appears to be a topping pattern on Thursday. Friday, we got a reversal of that. So for now, we have no conclusion that the 10 year has indeed topped. If it continues to go higher, we got more pain in the equities market coming. You look at the 30 year, similar story. We thought we got a topping pattern Thursday. Comes Friday, we have some sort of a reversal here. And if the 30 continues to go higher, we know it's overbought, we know it's due for a a pullback, we know all of that, but timing it is really tricky. If you're betting that, oh my God, the 30 year is stopping, I'm going to go ahead and buy the dips in the home builders, in construction. What if it continues to go higher? What if it has one more explosive move, a climactic ending year? Then your timing is going to be wrong in buying the dips in the XHB, ITB, home builders. On the other hand, if we have dips in the 30 year yield, we see correction of overbought conditions, then you're going to see rebounds in home builders and a lot of dividend paying names, but they're not going to be long lasting without a clear sign for a permanent top here, at least for this year. And of course, the number one sector that comes in mind when we talk about bond yields is utilities. And so far in this channel, we have nailed the trading in utilities, XLU. We called the bottom, we called the top in the recent moves. Let's take a look at that and then come back and identify what we have to look for for the next move. And if that is the case, look at XLU. It's way oversold. It's outside of the Bollinger Bands. It will rebound the moment we see yields uh, pulling back. And here's the update. XLU utilities moved significantly higher since then. But now what? Now we're becoming a little overbought outside of the Bollinger Bands. We had a lotto ticket betting against the XLU on Friday's session. Now that didn't happen, but the majority of you got out pretty much even because the XLU actually went down by a little bit on Friday's session and the contract appreciate a little bit in value to get you back to even, but maybe we're a day early here. We're going to see the XLU moving down this upcoming week as we see yields moving higher. Something to keep in mind. And folks, here's the update. Massive flush down in the XLU. And sort of unexplained, really. RSI really oversold. Uh, Bollinger Bands, we're trading outside of them right now. The lower Bollinger Bands. The risk versus reward says, you got to dip your toes here, buy some calls, betting on a rebound. Even if it is a dead cat bounce. It could take the chart all the way as high as 60, if not 61.78, in a big short covering rebound. But the trick is, you got to enter via increments. You buy a little bit right now. If uh, the 10 year, the 30 year yield continue to go higher. We could see a little more downside here. 
And this is why I say you got to buy in increments. Then once you see a clear reversal pattern in the 10 year, 30 year, and usually that's going to happen midday, midday massive reversal because of an auction, for example, or any related news, economic news, then you're going to double down and buy some XLU calls here. It's a short term trade, rebound trade. You make some money, then you dump it because I'm not really positive that we have seen the top in the 10 or 30 year yield. Matter of fact, I'm not really positive that we've seen the top in any bond yields right now. And then what about the VIX daily chart? What do we see here? A really important indicator for you to keep in mind. Number one, it closed above the important line of 17.08. That is bearish for the stock market, bullish for the VIX. It appears that we're forming a higher low in the pattern. It appears that the momentum indicators, be it the RSI or the MACD, still have plenty of room to go here for one more big pop in the VIX. And this is why I'm not positive that we're done here in the downside for equities. We need to see one climactic move in the VIX big pop that takes us to 20, 22. We see a big sell off in the stock market. Then I would say, OK, we have a tradable bottom here. If we zoom out and we look at the weekly chart for the VIX, you see the closing pattern here of a doji on the weekly chart for the VIX. It's a sign of indecision. And usually massive moves happen after indecision. We've seen the same pattern before and it produced big pops in the VIX. So my hunch is we're not done going higher here in the VIX. There's a big move coming. There was a massive decline in the stock market coming. And then we can talk about a tradable bottom and we trade a rebound all the way till the end of the year. We'll look at Apple, the big kahuna daily chart. What do we see here? Lots of weakness, no solid sign for a bottom here. And since we're already close to the blue line, which is the 200 days moving average, might as well go down and retest that, see how it holds. And the reason is, if we look at the weekly chart, we talked about an inverse ABC pattern. In this case, it needs to go down and retest the weekly moving average. That would be in or around, let's say, 163, 160. And then maybe we're going to have a bottom in Apple at that range, at least for the year. But my hunch is it's going to be a lot lower. It's just a gut feeling, not supported by any technicals for now. We look at Tesla, daily chart. What do we see here? Closing below the 50 MA in blue and below the 20 in white. So this is bearish not bullish, despite the rebound, because for now, the chart is forming a topping head and shoulder. If it closes above the 50, if it closes above the 20, then we're talking. But right now, the bears recaptured the momentum. If we look at the weekly chart for Tesla, what do we see here? You got to watch the white line, which is the 20 week moving average, because once we start to close below that, then we're going to have a confirmation of an inverse ABC pattern, which will take us all the way down to the 50 weekly moving average. And then we have NVIDIA daily chart. What do we see here? Caught a rebound from the 100 days moving average in blue. Now facing the resistance of the 20, 20 days moving average, excuse me, in white. So no conclusion here. Closing above the 20 days moving average will mean that we have more gains to come. Losing the support line, the trend line that you see in yellow, and going back to the 100, then losing the 100 days moving average. Then that would mean that you get a double down on your shorts in NVIDIA because we have more downside to come. We look at the weekly chart. What do we see here? Closing above the 20 MA for the week. Maybe staging a reversal here. But boy, if it loses the 20 MA again, that would be a confirmation that we're done here. We got the top in NVIDIA and down it goes from this point on. Lastly, tulips, Bitcoin, daily chart. What do we see here? The answer is nothing. For now, we have a pattern of lower highs. We're above 26,555, so that's good news. We could form a higher high to come but until that happens, until we close above the previous high, a better yet above the top of the bearish engulfing candle, and even better, closing above 29,200, then I'm not really interested here. Why so many barriers, Maverick, before you buy Bitcoin? The answer is... You got to show me the money here. There were so many failed attempts for a rally throughout the year. I got to see something solid here. Anyhow, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? We have plenty. Beginning Monday, October 2nd, we have the manufacturing PMI. We have construction spending. The manufacturing PMI will be really important for the pricing of the dollar and bond yields. And then on Tuesday the 3rd, we have job openings. That's going to be really important. Read the Fed policy, of course. Wednesday the 4th, we have the private payrolls by the ADP. And then we have the services PMI, factory orders on top of ISM services. Thursday the 5th, we have... Um, Initial jobless claims, we have the trade deficit, and I believe we have OPEC Plus meeting. You got to confirm that. Don't take my word for it. But lastly, Friday, October 6th, we have the non-farm payrolls by the kitchen, along with hourly wages and consumer credit. And that will be the most important day of the week. Folks, we have a lot ahead of us here, so uh, buckle up. 
And most importantly, if you're not a member of the channel, please consider joining. We're doing a lot of work here. Daily analysis, videos, lots of Discord, live streams now. We're doing a lot. And most folks are benefiting and making a lot of money. So consider joining. But besides that, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Home, none. Wife, none. Kids, none. Prospects, zero.